<laughs> the Diary of a CEO, the podcast, and now the book, The 33 Laws of Business and Life. Steve, welcome. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. Congratulations on the book. The book is absolutely awesome. This is the real deal, mate. So congratulations. Oh, mate. you're so kind. Uh, for people who don't know who you are, give us a bit of a potted history. Tell us, let's fast forward because we haven't got time, um, yeah. to, to the to 17, 18, 19 years old, um, and then a bit of um, long, big slide, big blue slide, a uh, bit of yeah. <laughs> investment, uh, and then we'll get to the book and then we'll crack on from there. Yeah, the TLDR of it came to the UK when I was a kid from Africa, was born in Botswana, was very insecure growing up, I think, because I was the only sort of black kid in a pretty much all white area we're also ended up being the, the poorest family in the area and you you understand the value of anything by by the context in which you see it and the context in which i saw myself had implicitly taught me that i wasn't enough so if i and the, the other confounding factor is my parents my mum in particular because i'm the youngest of four was they didn't parent me after the age of 10 and so you have this kid that wants stuff in life, but has this huge void of independence to go and experiment to get it. And that's really where my sort of self-belief comes from, which is my defining characteristic. Not good in school, dropped out, got kicked out, got unexpelled by my teacher. We, I did that show, What I Lied To You, the other day, and my head teacher came out and said, we unexpelled him because he made the school so much money. Um, and then they expelled me in the last week of school when I when I could no longer make them any money and uh, went to uni, drop out after one lecture, decide to start business, parents, my mum in particular told me she wouldn't speak to me again if I did. I pursued that, did that for a good 10 years. What was it? Um, at the time, it was a, a website called Wallpark, which was trying to bring physical notice boards in, on campus online. Um, and then I went on to, to start building social media and software businesses, which is what I do now, marketing and software. Tell so. us about the blue slide, the big blue slide. Yeah, it, one of the first things we did when we... I, it's such a stupid decision in hindsight, but it is just what it is. Um, I was 21 years old and we took a large investment into my company and one of the first things I bought was a £13,000 large blue slide with a ball pull before we had desks in the office. Or a sales team. Or a sales team. I'd asked all the team members, I said, well, you can all pick one thing for this new office, this warehouse we had. My thing was the blue slide. Someone wanted a basketball court. Um, and so that's what our office was. It was absolute madness. But as I talk about in the book, that was probably one of my best decisions in hindsight. <laughs> in hindsight, reverse yeah. engineered. So it's a 15,000 square foot office. You had 12 employees. Well, so it ended up being 15,000 square feet in that building. When we first moved in, it was slightly less, it was less than that. Still quite big. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but that's, it was 15,000 feet by the time I moved out. It's like 14 and a half. Uh, over three floors. So. But everybody wanted to come and film the slide, didn't they? Every sing every everybody. And this is this is what I I'd learned in hindsight was that the most absurd thing about your business or company or brand will say the most about your brand. And that blue slide. Every single time we had a reporter, whether it was the Gadget Show or the BBC or you name the channel, Vice News, they came down with a production company and did a doc documentary. They focused on this big blue slide because the blue slide told you a story about who we were. We were young, we were disruptive, we thought differently. And as I write in the book, the most the most useless absurd thing about your brand will say the most about your brand, not the most practical and useful. Yeah. And the best example I can give is my girlfriend joined the gym in Canary Wharf and she came home and she went, babe, there's this gym in Canary Wharf, they have, it, they're amazing. They even have a 100 foot climbing wall. And we all do that. And what, what she was actually saying to me there is if they have a 100 foot climbing wall, think about everything else they have. The most absurd and useless thing about your business says the most about it. I've joined that gym. I have never ever, and people will know because they know which gym I'm talking about. I've never seen anyone go near the climbing wall. But when I sell that gym to my friends, I mention the 100 foot climbing wall. And you see the same thing in big brands today. Brewdog have the, the beer fridges inside- Beer showers. Be, beer showers inside yeah. their hotel rooms. People don't talk about the pillows and the mattresses. Yeah. They talk about the most useless and absurd thing about the brand. Inefficiency and a logicality when you're building a brand does a tremendous amount of work to tell the whole brand story. Yeah, well, it screams culture. It's like you, you, talk, you speak to culture a lot in the book, and I know you speak to culture life it, generally. Um, you speak about companies being a company of people, not the building they're in, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But the culture, not but and the culture, therefore, um, is the source of or the manifestation of the mindset, which is the source of the voice. So you don't talk about the product, but what you're describing is the people who are producing whatever it is you're going to engage with. And they, they talk about, you know, I used to, well, I still know this great guy who's one of the greatest salesmen in the world. And he once said to me, what do you think is hardest for me to sell? Double glazing, which is where he started, washing machines, Porsches, by the way, he sold all these, or private jets. 
And I said, uh, washing machines. I don't know why, because there's more of them, white goods, and we all need one. He said, no, they're all the same, because I sell myself first, and then whatever comes in. And it's very similar, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's not similar to that. So much in the book, so much in the book. We're sitting here in Virgin Radio. Virgin Radio, Richard Branson, Virgin. (laughs) I wanted to work for Richard Branson all the way through my teenage years because of these legendary Christmas parties Virgin Radio, uh, sorry, the Virgin brand had. For the fact that he famously, his blue slide was this boat in Little Venice because he, his, the Virgin headquarters were a, were a houseboat. It was just mm. cool. Do you know what I mean? That kind of thing. Um, I mean, that's what I met Richard uh, a couple of, about six months ago. And if you think about Richard's story, in order to promote the brand that is Virgin, yeah. he did useless and absurd things. Yeah. He took these hot air balloons and drifted them across the ocean. And the story became even better when he nearly died. And all of that, you, all of that bizarre it's, extreme- it's personification, thing, isn't it? It fed into what Virgin meant. And yeah. it's the same thing. That blue slide fed into what my my company meant, and that's what that's what I, it's just a different frame to think through when you're building your business. That the most absurd thing you do will say the most about you, and do most of the marketing work. There is no, there is nothing that a marketing or CMO person at Virgin could have done that was more beneficial than Virgin than Richard doing those extreme stunts. Yeah. Um, and Red Bull, another prime example, throwing people out of you know a spacecraft and free falling to, to In the space. earth. space, yeah, yeah, yeah. The most absurd thing you do says the most about you, um, and it's a different frame to build brands around. CFOs won't typically let you do that because they will want an ROI, and they'll so in the blue slide analogy, they'll want to know how they're going to make fourteen thousand pounds return on investment. They'll want to know how that £13,000 slide will make £14,000 in cash. Yeah. Founders who are so entrenched in the brand's values will do this this kind of thing fluently, which is exactly what Richard did. He knew exactly what Virgin were. They were a disruptor. They were innovative. They thought differently. So he lived his life as a personification yeah. of that brand. And within there, you know, from a shareholding point of view, lies risk and therefore growth because you have growth companies and you have value companies and the value companies are glacial but they're pretty firm and solid not always but you know uh, they're the safer bet if you like but they're the least exciting um, and they're the least exponential Mm -hmm. you're speaking about Red Bull there to be at Red Bull yesterday was really interesting so I'll talk about it more tomorrow on the show but to be there yesterday was really interesting because every every Tuesday after a Grand Prix they have a debrief right and they have a big theatre at the Red Bull factory. Have you ever been? No. I You'd love it. You'd love it and they'd love you. And you should go and speak there. It's great. I'd love to. Um, I, I I sort of accidentally ended up speaking in front of 1,200 people yesterday. It was hilarious <laughs> for so many different reasons. I was there for my son's work experience. <laughs> I was waiting in the car park. And Christian Horn, really? who I know, said, do you want to come to the debrief? I went, yes, please. So 1,200 people, the whole factory stops. 1,200 people go into the theatre. Christian starts a proper, serious post Formula One race debrief with the head strategist, questions and answers from um, his workforce and then any other business. And at the end of it, he um, he he said, you know, Chris Evans is here. He's here for no. He said, Chris, do you want to get up and say a few words? That's another story, right? <laughs> uh, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. It was I it was a very unexpected, fantastic day out. But to be there was really interesting because they are currently right now at the top of their game. You know, to be there two days after they've won another Grand Prix, they've won the first 13 out of 22 Grand Prix this year, and they'll probably win the other nine. For so, You know, I mean, anything can happen, but they'll probably win all the races this year. But to be there in the middle of that, speaking to your uh, disruption and the alchemy, which the ROIs can't explain, Mm -hmm. you know, there's a department in... in, Sorry, I'm talking like it's your interview, but I think you might might like it. You just enthuse me. (laughs) So there's there's this department they call the Heritage Department, which sounds heritage, sounds like the past. No, no. They are the department who are given all the cars that are no longer needed for R&D or to win races. And Red Bull say... Do what you want with them. Just get us some publicity. So the last thing they did was they took the RB7, which was a Sebastian Vettel World Championship winning race car. They This is two weeks ago. They took it to Australia and drove it as fast as they could on the sand in a desert, a Formula One car. How hilarious is that? Of course that? they did. That's what of you're talking about. That's, that's, the, that's the sort of uh, stellar version of the blue slide, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, 100%. And that, they're a brand that personifies it. If you go on their Instagram right now, you, what you will not see is their product. I challenge anyone to go on their Instagram and try to find their product. What you will see is them doing these absurd stunts. They are, in my view, they are in Richard Branson's footsteps. 
in his wake. They're, they're copying his blueprint and they're a real strong founder-led business. I believe they're still owned by the family, like, if I'm like right. 100% and that's, that's, how, that's how it's possible because they're entrenched in the founding values. The minute you appoint a CEO to run that company and you get a couple of generations down the line of that, they'll lose their way and they'll, they'll go back to return on investment. How much money is driving this fast car on sand in the desert going to make us? And that's the wrong frame to think through. It's a short-term frame, but it's not an enduring long-term absurd frame, which is what we need. They and they enjoy their twentieth anniversary next year, and they've just commissioned. Uh, they've got a competition between J.J. Abrams' company and um, Brad Pitt's company to make the four-part documentary, the celebratory twentieth oh, really? anniversary of Red Bull, and they're still at the top of it. They haven't always been because they had that terrible Renault period. But anyway, blah blah blah. Right. So uh, the book we're talking about to Stephen Bartlett, the man who's written the blemin thing, the diary of his CEO, the thirty-three laws of business and life. So much, so much. I mean, it just, it's a stick. It's a it's a pin a tail on the donkey conversation because it's all gold. You can literally, you don't. I could get away with saying like I read this book and not read this book, but I really have read this book. Oh, I'm so. Um, tell us about the five buckets first. Let's start with the five buckets. It means so much to me, by the way. And do you know what? I'm I've not had feedback because the book is just just sort of come out into the world well it comes out tomorrow but so to hear that from you and to believe what you're saying it really means a lot to me because you don't know you like i sit in isolation and write this in the jungle and then i come back to the uk give it to my publisher and then six months passes and i'm having this conversation with you so it feels just wanted to say thank you the five buckets which is law number one um was an observation i'd had on my on my own life and people always ask me if you're young or if you're not or if you're you know moving into a new industry where should you focus in fact one of your colleagues asked me out there the way that I look at it is there's these five buckets in our lives that we have to fill. And the story that I tell was one of my friends in San Francisco had a man running up to him. This man was sweating, um, a little bit um, out of breath and said to him about building rockets and doing these chips in monkeys' brains and all this stuff. Then this man ran off. Then my friend said to me when I was in San Francisco, he goes, that man was Elon Musk. And interestingly, until he said that man was Elon Musk, I thought it was someone that had escaped from an asylum or something. But... The minute you hear that it's Elon Musk, you hear that this is an individual with five full buckets. In life, we have these five buckets, right? The first bucket is our knowledge, which is what we know. When we apply what we know, it becomes a skill, right? And these first two buckets, your knowledge and your skills, are the only buckets in your life that can ne no professional earthquake can ever unfill. They're also the buckets that overflow to fill these last three buckets, which is your network, your resources, and your reputation. When you have knowledge and skills, you'll undoubtedly build a network that will lead to, um, to resources and finally reputation. Life can take away these last three buckets, but if you're a young person, the key takeaway here is when you're selecting that job, like I was at 16, 17, 18, 19 years old, don't select for reputation, a nice jobs title. Don't even select for resources, get getting paid more. Focus on jobs that will fill these first two buckets, which is knowledge and skills. And for me, that meant spending four years working in call centers, which still today I, I cite as being the single most important professional experience I ever had. I spent four years picking up a phone and speaking to people about double glazing or artificial grass or conservatories or car insurance. And that, that skill of sales and communication has, has then translated to raising hundreds of millions in investment, to building businesses, to hiring thousands of people, um, having a podcast. And so it's just a frame to think through, which I think will, will, will set you up better for life. Okay. I'm just going to, I'm just going to play lucky dip here is that right with everyone yeah. I'm not, oh, God, I'm, by the way i'm not looking at the book it's just to okay. prove i've read it okay yeah. i'm gonna go for leaning into bizarre behavior next okay so the world is changing at an ever-increasing rate this whole ai conversation the web 3 the blockchain all of these interesting words and what i've noticed over time and when i looked at some of the stats from ray carswell who's one of the world's leading futurists is the rate of change in the world is only accelerating he predicts that if you're 10 today by the time you're 60 you'll experience a year's change in 11 days in the 21st century we'll experience 20,000 years of change so if you're a kid or if you're trying to give advice to your kid what do you say to them what book is going is going to stand the test of that um accelerating change what we need is a different attitude towards change which is what i call leaning in in my life across multiple across like one decade now there's been two tectonic shifts the first for me was social media and i built a business in that industry because i lent in when it sounded confusing and strange and there was pessimism i lent in and built a company there um we don't lean in because of dissonance this psychological feeling of friction when something new conflicts with what we know about the world or our identity so what we what we tend to do 
to resolve that dissonance, that cognitive friction, is to lean out and dismiss the thing. So you hear AI coming and you, because of the friction it will cause you, instead of just holding the dissonance, which is holding two conflicting ideas, the human brain has to dismiss the thing causing the friction. The issue with that is when innovation comes, it always creates dissonance. And we're seeing that now with AI. We saw it with the internet. When I remember watching the videos of people trying to explain the internet, the pessimism and the dismissal of it. We saw it when um, I, the iPhone was created and the CEO of Microsoft laughed on air and said a 500, 600 pound mobile phone, they have no chance. I love our strategy. That dissonance By the way, he's no longer at Microsoft. He's no longer at Microsoft. Surprise, the iPhone surprise. Stole market share, right? Um, it's, it's so important to understand that feeling. And even more recently, in the last two years, I experienced a huge amount of dissonance when this thing called blockchain technology came out. People selling these monkey pictures on the internet for six figures. What I did because of, because of principles, not because of my, how I felt, was I lent in. And that led to a company called Third Web. We've raised $31 million. The company has 50 employees in San Francisco. It's valued at hundreds of millions of dollars in our last investment raise. And because I lent in to that dissonance, that feeling of, you know, that something bizarre was happening, I was able to build companies. That's what we should be telling our kids. It's a mindset towards change we'll need for the 21st and 22nd century, when change is going to be at lightning speed. No, a book takes two, three years to publish. You know, strategies and tactics are outdated by the time this hits the shelves. But that lean in attitude towards disruption, I think, is, is the most important thing I teach my kids. That curiosity and then how to respond when new information conflicts with your existing information. And that's what I call lean in behavior. So good, man. It's all so good. Um, Rachel was halfway through the book last night, 368 pages long. Um, and I fortunately got to the end. So she doesn't know about the Goldilocks effect. I love the Goldilocks effect. I, I've, I'd heard of it before, but it was not never called out. It wasn't given that name. I've heard of the strategy before. Yeah, I love it. Mm -hmm. I've already I've been training all morning that when people hear it, they're going to use it today. Right. My favorite bit of it in being in your book is the fact that you were sort of hoodwinked by it. And you you know about these kind of things. So so just tell us the story. Tell us what it is by telling us the story of how you best came across an exemplar of it yeah it goes back to what, something i said at the beginning which is we understand the value of things by the context in which we see them and so our brain is um constantly doing this thing called anchoring where we're trying to use any data point we have to determine the rest of the picture we see so if you go into a, an electronics store and you see three tvs on the shelf the brain assumes that the expensive one is very bougie and is very posh. It'll assume that the, the cheapest one, just because of the context, is going to break probably and is probably not, not a great TV. And people will, in those studies, typically pick the middle option. It's the same on a menu when you see three steaks. You'll think, oh, A5 Wagyu, okay, leave that one out. Um, this one here, this sirloin thing, probably not going to taste great. So they'll go for the middle option just because of the context in which we see it. And when I did my, I've just had my offer accepted for a new house here in London, down near Victoria Park, and I was doing loads of viewings with my estate agent, and he was so insistent on showing me three properties, properties I had no desire to see at all. And it, and so he showed me this the first property, which was clearly um, on the cheaper end. It was smaller and a little bit cramped. Then he showed me this- but more other, than you thought it would be. And more than I thought it would be, yeah, yeah, and a little bit overpriced. He showed me this other property, which was- pretty extreme, very, very expensive. Then he showed me this third property, which was kind of in between the two. It had lots more space. It was a little bit more on the expensive end, but on a square foot for, for cost basis, it offered a lot more. And I obviously made an offer for that property. In hindsight, many months later, when I'm in preparation for this book, and I'm reading about this thing called cycle, called anchoring, where when we see three things, we're actually using the other two options to determine the value of 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 any of the options, I, t I sent him a text message and asked him if he knew about this and if estate agents were intentionally showing people properties they didn't want to change the perception of the property that they knew the person did want. So if you know someone wants a property number A, sh an estate agent should probably show them a, a, a property that's the same price, but considerably worse. It will trick the mind into thinking that property A is a great is great value, and that's what he did to me, and it's the house I'm about to move into now. Other examples of that is, I mean, the sort of the sleight of hand is usually it's um, the least expensive is more expensive than it should be. The one that they want you to buy often is the one you should buy, is 
a bit more expensive than the one that's not very good and too expensive. And then the third one is just so stupidly expensive. Mm -hmm. So the gap between the first two is much smaller than the gap between the middle one and the last one. Evinced in airline seats. Which is every which is every airline. So if you fly <laughs> a, economy to business... So economy usually, let's just say on a long haul flight, the ones I'm thinking about to New York, economy might cost you six, seven hundred pounds. Yeah. Business will probably be uh, two and a half times more than that, around two thousand pounds ish. Yeah. On an airline, then first class will be six to eight grand. Yeah. It's con it's usually about eight grand for if you go to LA. So considerably more expensive. What that then, in comparison, makes you believe is that business is a good option. They have more business seats, and if you look at how airlines make their money, so they don't make money from first class. They make their money from the people taking the business class seats, which is why post pandemic a lot of airlines are actually removing the, the top end options they want more people to buy those business class seats so they use the first class seats and if you go in singapore you literally have an apartment in the air with a shower purely as a way as an anchor to get you to buy those business class seats and the study that i talk about in the book as well is an, an experiment they conducted where they offered people um all-inclusive trip to paris or an all-inclusive trip to rome and in that study people would pick the all-inclusive trip to paris but then when they introduced a third option which was all inclusive. So the three options they now had in the, in the next study were all inclusive trip to Paris, all inclusive trip to Rome, or all inclusive trip to Rome without coffee. People would then choose the all inclusive trip to Rome. And that's purely because the, what the brain does there, the brain goes, if they, do you understand the psychology that the brain goes, if they removed coffee from Rome, oh. that must be because Rome is so valuable. So people would then change their decision and rather go to Rome without um without coffee because they assume that that's now a bargain purely because of the other two options and that's happening all the time and if you want to understand a deeper level why the brain uses context as a way to make value to understand value is because we don't have a lot of cognitive resource we can allocate to decision making if you think back to being on the serengeti a lion's running towards you you have to make quick decisions based on patterns and context you can't think through everything in life the brain would be too overwhelmed so we make these snap decisions based on context. Um, Which is why you decide on the house you want next quicker than the next pair of jeans you want. A hundred percent. It's crazy, isn't it? The, the higher the stakes, the more your n natural intuition you deploy. And your mm -hmm. intuition is the most useful. Because it basically it's your own inner exam results of all your experiences. One of the things I do in the book is I try and figure out where, where beliefs come from. Self-belief, the beliefs that the earth is flat, the belief in climate change. How do we, we, in order to change any belief, we need to understand where they come from. And it's my opinion, as is the title of one of the laws, that we don't actually choose any of our beliefs. And I, and I say that and I pause I because I, I, like, I like the, un, the uncomfortable feeling it gives people. Even if everything was on the line, the most important thing in your life, you couldn't choose to believe something else. And if you understand that you're not choosing your beliefs, you then have to go in search of how, how beliefs are created. And as I say in the book, they come from first party, tip, usually first party evidence that we've subjectively accepted as truth. Doesn't mean it is true. You know, that person bullying you at seven years old on the playground, it doesn't mean you are ugly, but that's a belief you accepted to be true. So if you want to make new beliefs, you have to then go and expose yourself to new evidence that you believe to be true. And if you look back at my story when I was 10 years old, my parents aren't in the house. My mum is sleeping in the back room of her corner shop. My dad is leaving his job and going and working there. I desperately want to have stuff and be successful like my, my rich white friends. So I start conducting experiments. And at 10 years old, I acqu acquire so much evidence that if I need them Rockport shoes or that new Blackberry phone, I can figure out how to how to make that money and you you get that information at 10 it starts positively compounding for you by 14 i'm doing deals for our school to have all the vending machines in there by 16 i'm running all the school trips um and that just continues off into you know i'm now 31 i that evidence for me has been compounding in my favor and that's what belief is so if i'm if, if you, you can't speak on stage you're gonna go and have to take one step outside of your comfort zone into your growth zone and start speaking on stage and, and learn that lesson in a safe environment that you are much more capable than you think you are um and that's what belief is and i think it's important because some people will look themselves in the mirror in the morning and they'll read these books about visualization and they'll say i'm a millionaire and i'm going to be so, so. That, you're lying to yourself and your brain knows you are if you want to change your beliefs in any belief you have if you're a flat earther the only way to change a flat earther's mind is to take them up in a rocket and show them earth they don't believe nasa they don't believe the source <laughs> So it has to be first Tim, party evidence. Tim Peake talks about flat. Oh, really? We had Tim Peake at our festival. Oh, really? And we, we asked him the flat earther question. 
And he said, even then they wouldn't believe you. And then <laughs> yes. um, Alan Watts talks about it. And he says the one way you could prove to a flat earth that the earth isn't flat is that you start off in London and you, t- you, you get them to traverse the globe from a latitude, longitudinal point of view sorry latitudinal point of view and they end up back in london but even then they would say well it may be cylindrical but it's not round <laughs> um and they you'd have to take the north pole to south pole um it's funny because on, on the same thing about about us about your beliefs um you don't choose your beliefs i i truly subscribe to the fact that there is no such thing as free will however that doesn't mean you can't have free will it just yeah. it just doesn't actually exist but you can still have it if you want it mm. anyway another, <laughs> another conversation 